I'm Katie Commender. I work for a nonprofit in Southwest Virginia called Appalachian Sustainable Development, and I'm their regional marketing and logistics coordinator for our local food hub, Appalachian Harvest. Um, and I wasn't able to attend the meeting in Maryland, so thank you so much, Mary, for uh, setting up this webinar today so I could kind of talk a little bit about the local food distribution work that we do. Um, I thought I'd start by just giving a brief overview of our Appalachian Harvest Food Hub um, and a new project that we're working on this year called the Central Appalachian Food Corridor that expands um, our work into West Virginia, Southern Ohio, and Eastern Kentucky. Um, and then kind of talk about you know how how we set up our distribution work, uh, our distribution routes, um, some of the logistics planning that we do to make sure that those those routes are financially viable, um, and to coordinate product delivery, um, even on the production side, all the way down to um, plant populations and phase plantings um, to coordinate with market demand, uh, and then you know I want to open it up to discussion, um, talk about any questions that people have and partnership opportunities that folks see maybe on, on the distribution side, on the production side. Um, if you know of a facility, you know, that could potentially potentially be used as an aggregation and, and storage facility for local farmers. Um, and, you know, basically any sort of partnership opportunities that you see, um, I'd love to talk about those as well. So at Patch and Harvest, um, we are a local food hub, but instead of operating as a for-profit business, we're actually a social enterprise, uh, like I said, under the nonprofit Appalachian Sustainable Development. Um, we're one of the oldest local food hubs in the country. We were founded in 2000 originally to help uh, transitioning uh, tobacco farmers um, into organic uh, wholesale production. Uh, today, we operate in Duffield, Virginia. So I know a lot of people think Virginia ends in Roanoke, but if you keep going down southwest, eventually you'll hit Duffield. Um, it's located on the map there. And we operate a USDA GAP facility. Um, it's 15,000 square feet. Uh, and some of the infrastructure that we have there, um, we have a washing and grading line that producers can bring their, their product in, wash, and and dry it and then pack it up, grate it. Um, on the right, you see a root washer. Um, we also are going to be operating that this fall. We'll be kind of dabbling with medicinal herbs, um, so things like uh, black cohosh root, uh, golden seal root, which we wash them, um, as we expand to more medicinal herb markets as well. Uh, we have uh, like an ice machine for crops like broccoli um, to meet those post-harvest family requirements. Uh, we also have two walk-in coolers with three different temperature zones and, and humidity. Uh, so this way we're able to work with a variety of different crops um, and make sure that we're post-harvest handling them properly so that the shelf life um, is increased. And that's really dramatically um, helped us, you know, really increase the shelf life of our product long term um, and access even more markets. Last year, we developed um, a hard squash storage tunnel. Um, and basically, it's just you know plastic sheet. Um, we have three by four plastic bins that the hard squash is stored in. There's a fan at the end of it that sucks the air out. And it helps circulate the air and kind of moderate the temperature and humidity so that we can store hard squash even longer. And then we also have things like you know, pallet jacks and forklifts. So once the producer um, brings in the finalized product, um, it's palletized, it's shrink wrapped, and then it's loaded. Um, we have three loading docks in the back of our packing house facility, and it's loaded onto two of our 53-foot um, tractor trailers um, that are refrigerated and sent off to markets. So just to give you an idea of the type of uh, farmers that we work with, Last year, we, I think we worked with about 70 farmers. They all have to be independently GAP certified in order to access the wholesale grocery store and produce broker markets that we work with. Um, and they can be organic or conventional. So prior to last year, we were primarily working in southwest Virginia and northeast Tennessee. Um, but as our, our demand is generally always higher than our supply, so it really created an opportunity for us to move into other areas of Central Appalachia with the Central Appalachian Food Corridor um, to provide farmers and, and even value-added producers access to some of those larger East Coast markets 
that we deal with. Um, so Eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, Southern Ohio now as well. The types of crops that our farmers can grow, um, you know, as it relates to distribution and logistics, it really depends a lot on location and their distance to Appalachian harvest. Um, so for instance, I, I mentioned we work with some more local farmers, as you call them, Southwest Virginia, Northeast Tennessee area. They're about an hour's driving distance from Appalachian harvest. So you know, if they're growing something like tomatoes, they really need to be picked and brought to us as soon as possible so that we can get it out to our buyers before it starts degrading and changing color. Um, you know, that's, that's an option for them. You know, as we move into um, central Appalachia, you know, southern Ohio, West Virginia, eastern Kentucky, beyond an hour away, um, we really wanted to set up kind of a tiered program that would help um, make farmers as successful as possible. So on this slide, um, it basically kind of describes the types of crops that um, farmers within the Central Appalachian Food Corridor um, can grow. Uh, so there's entry-level crops, like a hard squash trifecta, butternut, acorn, and spaghetti, um, that have a much longer shelf life than something like a tomato. So when we're dealing with um, distribution routes that maybe are, you know, they're kind of in their infancy right now. We don't necessarily have the ability to move product the day of harvest all the way to Appalachian harvest. Um, so dealing with crops that um, have a longer storage life um, is really useful uh, when we're just getting started. So as we kind of progress to a distribution route that you know, maybe can start moving product more quickly, um, we can advance to more moderate and advanced level crops. Um, so things like bell peppers, cabbage, and cucumbers. Um, now with that, we also need to increase um, in infrastructure capacity. So um, we need to look at things like a walk-in cooler that has the temperature and humidity zones that are appropriate for those different crops. And then, you know, let's say in year three, we could advance to more advanced level crops like broccoli and cauliflower. But again, the infrastructure needs to increase there as well with things like an ice machine. Um, so there's a lot of factors that are really, you know, involved in in determining what crops a farmer can grow. Um, but they all have to be independently GAP certified. Um, and there's the option for organic certification as well. And we assist growers um, in getting both of those certifications. So, you know, once we identify, you know, some farmers in the off season, um, you know, starting in November, December, our general manager, Robin Robbins, is really starting to make phone calls to our buyers to get a list of you know, what, what's their demand um, bi-weekly throughout the entire season? And that's for both conventional and organic produce. And then we take that demand and we transform it all the way down into plant populations and phase planting. So this way we can ensure to our buyers that um, over the course of the growing season, they're able to, um, we're able to supply enough to meet the demand. Um, so we've come up with some easy formulas to figure that out. Does it always work? No. Um, you have, has it always worked 100% for us? Definitely not. Um, and the reason being because, you know, if a farmer gets sick um, and they just can't plant that year, that's something that's out of our hands. Um, if, you know, Mother Nature opens up the skies and a big hailstorm comes in and there's a lot of crop loss, that's out of our hands. Um, but at least what we can do is try and create some sort of projections and forecasting so that we're, we're, we know where we're at in terms of supply to hopefully meet that demand. Um, and if we see in previous years maybe we're 20% off of that mark, then you know, maybe this year we can increase it 20%. Um, but what we don't want to do is end up flooding the market. Um, so we try to get it as close as possible. So for instance, you're trying. Um, you're trying. You're, you're the, trying, you're trying to, um, uh, balance it balance out. It out. I'm sorry, you're trying to balance out the demand and the supply? Yes. Yes, yeah. So we're trying to make sure that whatever demand we get from our, our buyers in November, December, um, that we're able to kind of backtrack that into plant populations and break it up into phase plantings, too, so that there's enough supply throughout the growing season and that our, our farmers are growing for a secured market, you know, the minute they put it in the ground. Um, and that's why we, we do this level of production planning. And then also in terms of logistics, it really helps us determine, you know, on just estimate, forecast um, how much we'll have on our trucks. 
so that we can coordinate deliveries better. Did that help answer your question? Yes. Okay, perfect. And if um, I think there's a chat feature too, and Mary said that she would help field some questions because on my screen I can't see um, the questions, but um, if you are on your computer, you could uh, type in some questions too, and uh, we'll get to those as they pop up. So I just I, I gave an example of some production planning that we might do. Um, you know, we have a demand for 300 cases of acorn squash uh, per week from August to the end of February, um, and so you know, 24 weeks period is where our market demand is times 300 cases. So we have about an average of you know 7,200 cases. Um, for our demand. On the production side, you know, we know that there is an average yield based on extension and um, university research of 285 cases per acre. Um, so if we take, you know, the, our total demand of 7,200 cases and we're dividing it by our average yield, 285 cases, um, we know that we need about 25 acres. So in the past, you know, if we see that we're about 20% off of that margin because of kale or health problems or whatever it may be, you know, maybe we'll increase that number by 20% to try and get closer and closer each year. Just to give you a sense of the type of volume um, that we're moving to wholesale distribution centers and produce brokers, um, I mentioned there's uh, 300 cases per week of acorn, but that's also for butternut and spaghetti squash each. Um, so our buyers are looking for the, the whole trifecta uh, in order to access that market. Um, and we have potential to increase that number all the way up to 1,000 cases per week. Um, you know, and so there's a real opportunity for expansion in West Virginia, Southern Ohio, Eastern Kentucky to start working with more and more growers and giving them the opportunity to access these growing markets. Um, this is just a funny slide is just to kind of give you a sense of how much green cabbage we moved last year is 425 tons and that's about equivalent to the weight of two Statues of Liberty. Um, so we're moving a lot of product, tons. Um, so our farmers, you know, how do we get product to market? Um, it's another one where it depends, right? So local farmers, so folks in southwest Virginia, northeast Tennessee, maybe an hour's driving distance, they deliver the final product to Appalachian Harvest. Um, if they have a packing shed at their farm, they can um, wash, grade, and pack there and then just bring it to us. It could even be after hours and they just put it in our cooler. Um, or they could even bring it to Appalachian Harvest and we have the washing and grading line there and they can do that work there. Um, for regional farmers, as we're expanding out into West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, Southern Ohio, um, it, you know, it all depends on um, if they have storage on their farm, um, you know, they can deliver their product to a nearby aggregation point um, if that, or they could, you know, our distribution partners can pick it up um, basically at any point that has a uh, loading dock um, or forklift access to it. So if farmers have something like that on their farm and it's along an existing distribution route, um, then that's, that could be an aggregation point. Um, or if they have, like our growers in um, Reedsville, they have a, a connection in Morgantown. They have a friend who has a loading dock. So they just bring the product there on an agreed upon day and time where existing distributors are already going. Um, and then that product is back hauled to Appalachian Harvest. So once it gets to our facility, we are then aggregating it onto a pallet. So that really helps us, that aggregation helps us work with farmers all the way down to a quarter acre all the way up to 100 acres. Um, you know, the 100 acre farmers are, are helping, you know, with the, the bigger volume, but they also allow the quarter acre farmers to get a few cases here and there on a full pallet. Um, and then we're distributing that final product to wholesale distribution centers all the way um, from Atlanta, Georgia, down on our southern run. Um, we go through North Carolina and then down to Georgia, and all the way up to Maryland on our northern run. Um, and because the, the distribution meeting that was in Maryland a few weeks ago, I just wanted to kind of break down uh, our route schedule so you have an idea of, of where we are and when, um, in case there's any potential um, distribution partnership opportunities there. So our northern run runs from July 1st all the way through August 31st. Um, we have you know everything from 
sweet corn and cucumbers, broccoli, variety of different produce items that we're delivering um, to wholesale distribution centers. Um, we leave our packing house facility in Duffield, Virginia, every Wednesday and Sunday around 10 a.m. And then we're making our way up to Ashland, Virginia on the same day by 2 p.m. Uh, and then our final stop for that day is up in Jessup, Maryland around 8 p.m. And if we have extra supply after that, um, we can partner with the other uh, distribution partners to bring that extra supply to Philly, uh, Pennsylvania. And then the next day, our driver wakes up, and, and he's coming back down on Thursday or Monday. Um, and he's coming down to Hillsville, Virginia, um, where we partner with the Southwest Virginia Farmers Market. Um, and we back call some, some of their products from their farmers to Duffield. Um, we get back to Duffield around 4 p.m. Um, so that's kind of, a, of an overview of our northern run. You know, if there are um, folks who are in that just a minute area, um, and maybe, you know, they, maybe you need access to more markets, or maybe um, if you're coming from the eastern panhandle in West Virginia, um, we have farmers there. You know, we could potentially um, be able to get those products onto our, our truck as a backhaul back down to um, Duffield. So there could be a variety of different partnership opportunities there on our northern route. Um, one of the big things, you know, in addition to production planning so we can kind of forecast our supply, we're also really heavily keeping track of our, you know, both our, um, our revenue with how much product we have on the truck. Um, and then we also take a 20% commission in order to cover our distribution expenses, um, any truck repairs, our staff time and our operational expenses uh, for the packing facility. We're also really heavily tracking our driving expenses um, and just yearly expenses in general. So we have a uh, route calculator that we use for every single run um, that we, uh, that leaves every single truck that leaves Appalachian Harvest. We have an estimated cost um, and an estimated revenue that we're making on that to make sure that that route's financially viable. Um, and if it's, if it's looking like it's not gonna be, then we need to find a way to get more product on the truck um, or identify backhauls to make it more feasible. So this is just kind of a screenshot of our expense report that we run. Um, for example, on our southern run and northern run you see here, we're really keeping track of everything from our mileage, the amount of time that our driver's on the road, um, our miles per gallon, our, the number of, amount of gallons of gas that we're using, our fuel rate to kind of um, total up um, our fuel cost, and then we're also calculating our driver expenses um, with hourly rates and, and meals and that kind of stuff so we can get a sense of how much it costs uh, per run. And then we're also, you know, digging a little deeper and looking at things like taxes that we have to pay quarterly um, and some yearly taxes. Um, and then also, you know, truck repairs if we need um, tires, uh, if we need you know, car wash, a truck wash, you know, the, all those little expenses, we're tracking all of them. Um, and that's, you know, we need to we need to do that in order to make sure that all of our runs are financially viable. And then in the end, you know, we take our, our revenue summary and we take our expense summary and um, we, we have this root viability summary. We're trying to figure out, you know, what's our profit margins? You know, are we coming out ahead? Um, so that we can keep putting money back into the packing house. Um, and, you know, we can employ our, our staff and, you know, we can keep a roof over our heads and, and keep supporting mobile farmers. Um, so we're really, we're really tracking all of our revenue, all of our expenses. And one of the big things that I want to mention here, um, if you see my mouse on the top left-hand corner, that's called an outgoing income. So, you know, when we first started in distribution, we weren't necessarily putting two and two together that, you know, if you have an empty truck, you're bleeding money. Um, and so, you know, if we're going down to Atlanta and we drop off produce and we now have an empty truck, if that truck all goes all the way from Atlanta to Duffield, we are losing a lot of money and it doesn't make it financially viable for us to distribute local food. So we needed to figure out what we could put on our truck to backhaul somewhere along that route. It doesn't have to be in Duffield, it just has to be somewhere along that route, um, so that we have a full truck, at least for part of the way back, to offset some of that cost. So 
you know what? It doesn't even have to be local food. We dabble with baby formula, of all things. Um, when I was in Portland um, at a distribution meeting back in January, uh, there's a group of, you know, the last two mile distributors. They are on their little electric bikes, um, cute as can be, with their uh, refrigerated trailers attached to the back. Um, and they're back hauling office chairs for office people. Uh, and they also have um, advertisement wraps that are around the, um, the trailer that they pull behind. And they rotate that out quarterly. And they, they, sh they openly shared their business model and said, hey, you know what? With, if it wasn't for the advertisement wraps that we sell, you know, we make more on advertisement than we do on local food distribution. And the back hauls, we wouldn't be in business. So you really need to kind of think outside the box and making sure that you have product on your truck at all times. And it doesn't have to be just food. So I, I keep mentioning the Central Appalachian Food Corridor. Um, and I kind of just want to talk a little bit how, about how the distribution works for that. Because you know, as it is you know, prior to last year, we just had farmers in southwest Virginia, northeast Tennessee, an hour away. They brought the product to us. As you know, our, our markets expand and our buyer demand expands, we're able to reach out and work with more and more farmers. But if they're six hours away in West Virginia, how do we get it you know, from rural West Virginia to Duffield um, in Southwest Virginia? So here's the challenge. You know, this is just this is a picture of where Appalachian Harvest is, and these are some of the counties that we're working in. It's a very large um, range. Uh, so trying to figure out those distribution logistics was not easy. Um, but I'm going to kind of share some lessons that, that we learned in the past year and then see if there are any other partnership opportunities that we could look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. distribution okay. partnership. What we ended up doing, you know, is looking for existing yeah, distribu fine. distributors. Fine. Sorry? We started partnering with existing um, distribution partners who already have trucks on the road. Um, so we noticed, for instance, Crook Brothers, their truck was driving by Appalachian Harvest twice a week. And you know, then I found, I looked them up and I well, said, hey, you know, they're located in Backley, West Virginia. I wonder where else they go in West Virginia. So picked up the phone, started talking to them, and it turns out that their routes go roughly where all of our farmers are um, growing in West Virginia. You know, we have farmers growing close to Morgantown. We have farmers growing close to Huntington, farmers growing close to Beckley, and we also have a new farmer this year in the Ripley area. Um, and so just started talking to them about the potential, you know, how much room do you have on your truck? If you're already going to Morgantown, for instance, twice a week, do you have room on your truck for a backhaul? Um, and the answer was yes, they did. They had plenty of room on a backhaul, so they actually were able to make some money, and it benefited them. Um, because their truck wasn't as empty as it was before. Um, and so, you know, trying to look at what I, I would ideally like to see, you know, there's no reason for Appalachian Harvest to bring a truck into West Virginia. If we can partner with folks who already have trucks on the road, um, and it benefits them, and it, and it benefits our farmers by, able, by giving them access to our markets, then um, by all means, let's try and figure out how that works. 